Welcome back to our uh, closing plenary session for this, um, this spring's uh, CNI membership meeting. I trust that you have all had a valuable meeting, had an opportunity to catch up with old and new colleagues, to see some interesting things, to learn some new things. Um, but I hope you have uh, kept some um, mental cycles in reserve for what I think is going to be a um, mind-stretching uh, closing talk this afternoon. Before we get there, I have just a couple of things on my list. A very short story I cannot resist telling. Um, a couple of reminders and a couple of thank yous. The very short story. Paul Peters and I um, shared a great admiration for the work of a science fiction writer named Daniel Keyes Moran. A few of you who've been involved with the coalition for a long time may remember that Paul invited him to come and speak to us in 1995 in Washington, D.C. at one of our meetings. And he gave a wonderful speech which included um, uh, some readings from his next book. His next book hit some delays, but I'm delighted to say it was finally published and available on the net as an e-book last week. Um, and uh, well worth the wait for those who enjoy his work. But that was a piece of, um, of closure that I just uh, wanted to uh, share with everybody who was interested. Reminders. In your um, packet, you have a hold the date for our December meeting in 2011. That will be at the same hotel in um, Arlington, the Marriott, that uh, we had our, um, our December meeting in 2010 at. We have just completed arrangements and will um, imminently, if we've not done so already, be putting updates for the 2012 uh, December meeting. That will be back in uh, the District of Columbia proper, proper at the uh, Capitol Hilton, so I hope you will jot down both of those dates. We should um, be announcing dates for the spring uh, 2012 meeting uh, in probably the next month, and that will go out through CNI announce. I also just want to note the um, international uh, data uh, digital um, curation uh, meeting that um, the uh, UK Dig Digital Curation Center does every year. And we will again um, be very proud to be a co-sponsor of that. That meeting has had its date changed and is now set for December 5th through 7th um, in Bristol. And more information on that later uh, through CNI announced on the website. But if you've got that on your uh, calendar, you might want to just update those dates. Finally, I'd just like to thank all of the presenters who've been with us today and yesterday. We've had a very, very rich set of parallel sessions. Um, I was able to drop into a number of them, and I, I think the quality was just wonderful. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, as always, profoundly grateful for the people who've made their time and expertise available to help all of us learn from their work and their insights. So I'd ask you to join me in a big hand for all of our presenters. I'd also like to thank the CNI team for making another meeting run so smoothly that it just seemed like it was all taking care of itself. Um, uh, that's, that's an art, and um, it's an art that uh, I'm very grateful to have practitioners of working with us. Uh, please join me in thanking them for making that happen. <laughs> I 
And now let me get on to the main event here. CNI has long had a deep interest in the way that technology is changing the humanities, um, the way it is enabling new kinds of insights, uh, new kinds of communication, the understanding of new kinds of evidence, the way it is um, breaking down disciplinary grant, um, barriers between individual humanistic uh, disciplines. We've had a whole series of speakers over the years um, who have uh, given us insights in uh, the way things are developing there. Um, some of you may remember Bernie Frischer um, from a couple of years ago, or um, the uh, presentation uh, last year from Dan Cohen from uh, George Mason University, or earlier um, some of the work that uh, Greg Crane has talked about. Today, we have another pioneer in the digital humanities um, who has uh, combined a fascinating portfolio of technologies to really look at some intellectual questions that cut across many, many um, humanistic concerns. Todd Pressner is a professor at UCLA of Germanic Languages and Comparative Literature. He also is the chair and leader of the Digital Humanities Program, which UCLA is um, making a pretty substantial commitment to. He told me that they have got um, 36 faculty involved in this, which um, really puts it at a scale um, comparable to anything I'm familiar with uh, that's, that's going on in the States, um, and uh, is rolling out digital humanities uh, majors and minors, um, which again is uh, one of these really important steps because it begins to build um, uh, you know, a future, a future cadre and, and shape, the, uh, shape the discipline. Um, Todd has been working for some years on a system that he's going to tell us about today called HyperCities, um, which I hope you will find as fascinating as I find it. And I'm not going to try and describe it anymore because um, it's, it's much better to see it and to hear Todd tell you about it. Please join me in welcoming Todd Pressner. Welcome. So, well, thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you this afternoon. And uh, thank you for your fortitude uh, the last couple of days. Um, I'm really honored and, and humbled, uh, honestly, to be able to present some of the work that we've been doing in the digital humanities uh, to this audience, and also to bookend with my colleague, uh, Chris Borgman, who I've admired uh, since coming to UCLA uh, in 2001. Um, and I want to thank CNI, Cliff, and, and Joan especially for your support. So I'm going to be uh, presenting a project that really has um, in some ways paralleled, I guess, the past 11 or so years of the digital humanities called HyperCities. Um, it's a project which has gone through a number of substantial iterations and transformations as new technologies have emerged and as new possibilities for asking and beginning to propose answers to uh, vexing humanities questions, particularly humanities questions concerned with uh, historical mapping, concerned with um, possible futures, and ideas that are rooted, I think, in core concerns of the humanities, complexity, ambiguity, contingency. Um, and uh, I think you'll see some of these projects uh, today. Um, I'll speak for about 45 minutes, and I'm going to speak initially from a PowerPoint, uh, and then I'm going to go to a series of live uh, different sites that HyperCities has been involved with. Um, because the connection is a slightly precarious, I decided I would, I would use this backup to make sure that things actually do load. So we'll start uh, with a German Jewish philosopher, 
uh, Walter Benjamin. Uh, he was um, born in Berlin uh, in 1932 when the Nazis uh, were coming to power. He fled to France and spent the last 12 years of his life working on a project of architectural history called the Arcades Project. It was a kind of uh, montage-like history of Paris, particularly what he saw to be the capital of the 19th century. He called Paris the capital of modernity. Uh, he traced the streets, he traced the buildings, he traced the modes of dress, he traced the mores of the period uh, in Paris, and uh, wrote extensively about the experience of trying to reconstruct a city through narrative means. Um, he writes about the street. Uh, the street conducts the flaneur. This is the person walking through the street. Uh, the, the reference here to Edgar Allan Poe or Baudelaire, um, poets and thinkers who experienced the great uh, cities of modernity like London, Paris. It conducts the flaneur into a vanished time. For him, every street is precipitous. It leads downward into a past that can be all the more spellbinding because it's not his own. It's an extraordinary statement, I think, uh, because it already gets us to one of the core concerns of hypercities and really one of the core concerns in the digital humanities, which is historical knowledge, time, right, ideas about temporality, and ideas about spatiality, space. The street, after all, is a place that one walks down, but one doesn't walk down simply in a single time as one might go diachronically, or sorry, synchronically, but rather one is able to go back in time. One goes down into a vanished time. It's precipitous. It leads downward. This idea is something, this idea of thinking about streets as layers, or thinking about space as layers, was an instrumental idea as I began to think about um, the Hypercities project. And it was actually in Berlin that I began to have my first experiences of trying to think through how one might, as a flaneur, be conducted downward in time. Back in 2001, I, I began to uh, geo-reference maps manually. Uh, this is a, a torturous, arduous, and relatively silly process now. But nevertheless, this is what we were doing. I wasn't familiar with GIS. And uh, I had historical maps. And I thought this was a really interesting way to begin to think through layers of city spaces. But it was a little bit more complicated than just historical maps, because I thought, well, what if you could pinpoint, you know, my grandmother was born here in 1935, and then she moved here in 1937, and here in 1977, and here she lives in 2007. And one began to have a narrative, almost like a family genealogy that could be like a line, a polyline that moved through time and space. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be even more interesting if you could have many, thousands of these stories? Imagine many different polylines moving through time and space, and that one could take an urban space as a model and actually core down, sort of what archaeologists uh, do when they go to the North Pole and they do coring down into the ice. You have 50,000 years of time, right, in an ice capsule. And I thought, that's a really interesting model to begin to think about urban experience. What if one could take a street and say, you know what, I want this street, here's my bounding box, and I want 500 years. I want data about the street. It may be data about who lived there, census data perhaps. It may be data about stories. It may be family histories. Um, it may be census data. It could be all sorts of information intersecting, and it would all be time space specific. And so this was the origination uh, of a project uh, which I've been working on for the past 11 years with colleagues um, internationally um, in a number of fields from history to architecture history, urban planning, GIS, um, and archaeologists as well. Uh, it's a project that I think, as you'll see, the scope and the complexity, which a single person really can't possibly do because it requires the disciplinary methods of so many disciplines, not to mention the input of scholars and um, activists from all different walks of life. So hypercities is actually a, a coinage that refers to the media theorist Ted Nelson. Um, many of you probably know Ted Nelson's work um, because he coined the term hypermedia and hypertext. Um, hypercities is very much meant to be in that, that semantic lineage. Uh, a hypertext uh, for Ted Nelson was a text that could not be reduced to a single medium because what was being presented, the data that was being presented, simply couldn't be represented in a single medium, particularly paper. Uh, the connections between the data points were too complicated. Uh, it was a nonlinear system. It was an ever uh, recursive system that potentially built out in many different ways. 
And I thought, what an interesting way to consider a hypercity. So rather than a city being a fixed uh, geographical space uh, with a fixed architecture or a kind, of, um, a kind of stasis, what if it was something that could be uh, connected, so to speak, information networks could be connected to physical landscapes, and they would interpenetrate in interesting ways, that they would potentially open up and it would be open, participatory, people could tell family histories, could create video histories, could tag locations, could curate data all about the city space that they knew and lived in. Um, this would be an amazing project as well, at least in my thinking, was because it was a project connected very fundamentally with humanities concerns, particularly concerns around historical memory and ideas of looking for traces of the vanished past. Um, when I was in Berlin in 1995, this is shortly after the wall came down, there were many traces of the vanished past. I mean, not only of Jewish Berlin, but also the fact that there had been so many changes of regime that were in play. And one saw these sort of open wounds in the architectural spaces of the present. And how to make sense of them was really a very big challenge. There was no platform, there was no authoring platform that could help one to make sense of this, this complexity. Over the years, um, I mentioned we've collaborated with a number of folks, uh, institutions uh, from USC to the City University of New York to the Technical University in Berlin and to uh, the University of Virginia and many other places to develop a series of what could be called hyper cities, which are information networks uh, connecting social media together with um, what's generally called GIS. Uh, to illuminate aspects of the layered history, layered cultural and social histories of city spaces. Um, if you go to hypercities.com, this will take you to the main page here. And that's uh, the sort of starting point to see some of the projects that we've been working on. Um, there's a, a Google project that you can see down there that we began working on, which is to create rich maps uh, for Google Books. Um, they have places mentioned in this book often for books that provides a kind of algorithmic um, mapping of places mentioned in books, and we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to feed it into our GIS server and actually have more historical information, historical maps, and historical data that may actually illuminate uh, one's reading of, say, The Great Gatsby or any other historical novel. In 2005, 2006, uh, the idea for hypercities began to change quite a bit when, with the emergence of social technologies and more participatory collaborative networks. And uh, you can see when I made this slide, actually about five years ago, phones look like that. And um, I, I show this partially because I think I, I wanted to indicate something about the history of a, this project. The history of this project uh, was really a fundamental idea of linking time and space together linking a temporal coordinate with a spatial coordinate or multiple temporal and spatial coordinates together so that one can move synchronically and, and diachronically. That it was connected to a physical space as much as an information space. Um, we weren't able to do this uh, with phones in 2005 and we're just starting to be able to do this now and I'll talk about a couple of the projects that we've taken into the urban space in Los Angeles to do historical, historical mapping. So this was also a project that I think was trying to set um, a vision uh, which would only be realized uh, in the years to come. It was very much motivated by an idea that I thought you really couldn't have a view from above, but you had to have a view from the ground. So this meant that there had to be some kind of openness uh, built into the platform, authoring tools, ways for people to uh, create, interoperable, um, create interoperable data that could be shared, that is exported outside of hypercities and also imported into hypercities. That was a, a critical part of, of the idea. And we're still moving in this direction today where I imagine that there'll be constellations of hypercities projects. Uh, people will be able to run their own instantiations of hypercities working on local histories, community histories, and be able to connect them together. So it would be truly a very distributed, um, a distributed model for thinking about the urban historical landscape. This is still something that's to come. But I'm going to start by just giving a, just a very brief background about some of the participatory projects within the field of what might be called neo-geography, because this is really something that Hypercities has been very much in tune with. And for the digital humanities, what this means is the creation of a lot of data, some of which uh, is, many, much of which I should say, is quite complex and uh, really raises, I think, some very fundamental questions about collection creation, collection curation, uh, sustainability, preservation of data. 
Um, obviously, the most well-known um, place for geospatial visualization and data is certainly Google Earth. Uh, all of us use this. Um, Google Earth, I think, perhaps because of its ease of use um, as an application, is something that I think has really, in some ways, opened up geo or geospatial um, thinking uh, to audiences far beyond the academy. And this, I think, has been a very positive thing. Uh, we've tried to collaborate in our hyper cities with community partners because so much of the knowledge is community-based. Um, an example of, I think, a sophisticated project, and sorry for the blurry screenshot, is uh, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum's projects to um, document the crisis in Darfur. Um, this is a screenshot um, <coughs> from that project. So certainly, you have things on one end of the spectrum like this. And on the far other end of the spectrum, perhaps, you have uh, the great Los Angeles cupcake map, uh, which is uh, perhaps not as, not as serious and perhaps not as, um, but yet, if you want a cupcake, it's very serious. Um, but uh, this is a map created in Google My Maps and easily exportable in a, what's now a standard KML. Um, and this standard is supported by the Open Geospatial Consortium, and it's a standard that we use in hypercities, as well as the other standard for mapping, which is WMS, uh, the web mapping service, uh, web mapping standard. Um, other kind of in between these two projects, uh, George Mason had done a very interesting and I think fascinating project uh, documenting stories uh, from Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita Again, a kind of Google Maps mashup project that utilized a participatory dimension, people tagging locations, adding pictures, video, stories, narratives, in order to build out a more complex um, picture of what had happened and, and the stories around the event. <clears throat> Finally, let me mention a project called the Digital Harlem, which is uh, done by a number of historians um, <clears throat> and this is a project which, uh, as you can begin to piece together, is a Google Maps mashup as well, but utilizes uh, a sophisticated GIS uh, database in order to unravel um, parts of the history of this uh, relatively bounded uh, spatial landscape. So Harlem, 1920 to 1930, based on data that's been accumulated from a number of sources around uh, crimes, um, events, churches, everyday history of, of Harlem. And one has a number of map layers that can be placed on top of this in order to illuminate uh, this, this history. So let me turn to HyperCities and tell you a little bit about this project and look at the interface. And I'll tell you about some of the projects that we've been working on. I have to apologize for my, my cough. I've been sick the past couple of days, and so I have to feverishly drink water. So HyperCities is also a Google Maps uh, Earth uh, map mashup. It's built on the Maps and Earth API. And uh, what we did was we introduced two, I think, very significant dimensions. One is a timeline at the top. The timeline allows you to zoom in and out of the past. Um, so <clears throat> the granularity down to a second all the way up to a millennium is something that we support. And there's a series of cities. Um, this is back in 2008. We had uh, um, only a small number of cities, Berlin, LA, New York, Ayanti Tambo in Peru, Rome, and Tel Aviv uh, as the main cities we were working on. And since then, we've grown substantially to have about 15 cities uh, that are now, quote unquote, hyper cities. What this means is these are places where we have institutional collaborations with partners, whether they're institutions as libraries, colleges. Um, they may be community organizations. They may be historical societies. In the case of New York, there's the New York Public Library, which um, has a repository of maps that are fed, uh, which are capable of being fed into hypercities. And this is something we're working on even more so. Um, and a series of classes, institutions that are working on building out parts of these cities. Um, we use the open ID in terms of a login. So we allow people to use existing logins through Facebook or Google. Um, we don't maintain uh, that material. And what you have when you go into HyperCities are a series of maps and a series of collections. These collections are, can be public, 
They can be classes, they can be featured collections, they can be curated, or they can be private. And what this means is that you, anyone can log in, anyone can begin to create materials about a city and curate content about that place. Um, so if you were to look uh, in Berlin in the general collection, an example, we have about 40 historical maps. These are georectified maps stretching back from 1237 when Berlin was founded all the way up until 2009. Um, and then, of course, the contemporary satellite data, which is provided by Google. So what you're seeing here is a, a map of Berlin from 1772, georectified, and the root of the Berlin Wall. Um, a couple of things that are interesting here. One, um, if the Berlin Wall was put up in 1772, what's interesting about Berlin is almost the entire city is in the east. Um, that's because the city center, which you can almost make out here, was a fortified city. Um, it was right around here. <coughs> Very little of this is still maintained today. In fact, it was mainly filled in over the years. Um, but the river still runs through Berlin. And as you can kind of see with the georectification, it, it lines up quite nicely. Um, Hypercities has about 250 historical maps uh, available in 2D and 3D. Uh, those are within the Hypercity system. And then the possibility of thousands of more maps through its interoperable web services. So basically, for example, the New York Public Library with a georectified map set can feed data directly into Hypercities and we can properly display it. What you see in terms of the line there is just a tracing of the Berlin Wall that a user can then place on top of a map. And this begins to initiate this idea of layering. One can then place additional data. It can be as simple as, you know, my grandmother lived here, or it can be a much more complicated story that may connect to some aspect of the history of that location. So in terms of curating projects, this is an example of a project that could be curated in hypercities. And so what we have over here is a narrative view, is what we call it, where one keys particular aspects of the narrative to a location. The unique thing about hypercities is that we wanted to create a system where the database returned objects as a function of time and place. And so the six parameters by which all the data is always organized in hypercities is a start date and an end date. Um, and of course, you can have multiple. You can have it. It can be multiple start dates and multiple end dates, especially if a building is built and destroyed and rebuilt and built again and so forth. And we also have a bounding box, which is just a place the four corners of a map. As you browse within hypercities, it automatically returns data as a function of the area, the time span, and the place span that you're looking at. This, I thought, was a fairly uh, interesting way to think about how humanities data could be retrieved. So instead of knowing precisely what you're looking for ahead of time, as in doing a keyword search, I thought mainly the experience of experiencing a city, particularly a foreign city like a flaneur, is really to be immersed in the city. You have to go there and look around, right? You have to discover things. You have to go down the wrong street. You have to get lost. And so very much the idea of hypercities was you go to Berlin or you go to New York or perhaps a city you don't know, and you look around. And as you browse by zooming in and out, by changing the time frame, by zooming in further or zooming out, you're going to get different data because the database is constantly returning data as a function of the time span and the place that you're looking at. Now, this is a curated collection uh, of the history of the Berlin Castle. And so the location is indicated there. There's a series of narrative and, and narrative you know, objects. And each one is also connected to a particular view uh, within hypercities. I'll show you sort of how this works a little later, because this allows us to create um, what I think are the basis of digital publications in a geotemporal visualization environment. This is um, a screenshot of a student project. Our students, um, we have now thousands of students who have used the platform at, at a number of universities um, from USC, UCLA, Occidental, the City University of New York, the Technical University in Berlin, University of Michigan. And um, the content they create is really often quite extraordinary. What the students do is they work in teams, and uh, at least in the class that I'm showing here, and they've created objects dealing with particular places in the city. In this case, this is the location of the Palace of the Republic, which is, is a 3D model 
which the students created, sitting on top of a 1970 map of Berlin in the Earth View, and then a series of photographs and narratives explaining what the location, the significance of this place is. And there's actually a series of layered collections. So what Hypercities allows you to do is to create layered collections, collections within collections within collections. And so you literally delve deeper as you explore the narrative features. And again, each part of the narrative is always connected with a particular viewing, uh, viewing um, stage of viewing, you might say, on the left. I'll show you um, sort of building on that is that we've been looking at embedding hypercities and other websites over the past couple years with the idea that some of the collections that have been created in hypercities <coughs> are, I think, on par with what you might expect in any kind of academic journal or digital publication. And so we thought one of the things we like to do is to show publishers and also libraries what's possible in this kind of an environment, and particularly when it comes to the fact that you really can't print this article out and have the same kind of effect. Um, that is to say, the viewing environment, this geotemporal viewing environment, is critical for the way the argument is made. So this is a project that we did um, with Diane Favreau and Gregor Callas, uh, who's an art historian, classic scholar. And what he wanted to do was um, utilize models that were created by actually Bernie Frischer and Diane Favreau in the late 1990s for the Roman Forum. So these models were created not for hypercities, but rather for an entirely different project. Um, in fact, several years before hypercities was even invented. These models were rescaled, put within Google Earth, and the idea was he wanted to add additional dimensions, particularly concerning statuary, display, and imperial processions through the Roman Forum. And so what you're seeing is the zoomed out version of the article, and then the article is on the right-hand side. As you move through the article, each section of the article is keyed to a particular location in the Roman Forum, and the models that he created, the statue, uh, statuary models and inscriptions are all part of the argument that, he's been, that he analyzes for <clears throat> what he calls the polemics of statue display. We wanted it to be recognizable to scholars in the field. That is to say, it had to have footnotes, had to have a bibliography, had to cite the methodologies and best practices of the discipline. And so this was something that you can click on the footnotes, you'll get the references, but the argument itself, like the idea of a hypertext from Ted Nelson, cannot be reduced to a single medium. So I'm going to go to Los Angeles and talk to you. I really apologize for my voice, but I knew that if I talked too much, I was going to lose it. Hmm. I'll talk to you a couple of examples of what we've been doing in LA and to try to show you about how this platform relates to communities. This is the place where we've actually done the most work um, with community organizations in Los Angeles, particularly historic Filipino town, and the idea here of working with youth in uh, LA's historic Filipino town to tell stories about their locations and their experiences. We've done this using Nokia tablets, where we've put historical maps from hypercities and data that they created, curated, um, and allowed people to take tours, essentially walking tours of the city space, um, with stories that they themselves, the, his, the youth, have, have created. In hypercities, um, they curated a number of projects utilizing historical maps, utilizing historical photographs, some of these are actually coming from USC's uh, photo archive that Todd Gopone uh, had worked on a number of years ago. And others are coming from our historical map archives at UCLA. And so already, again, this idea of interoperability is very important because so many of these objects are connected with um, spatial dimension. The students um, investigated various aspects of the history of historic Filipino town, which is this 
area here. But what they found was the history of Filipinos in Los Angeles is actually a history that is not connected with that particular part of the city, but actually other parts uh, around it. So these are locations of World War I registrants, um, Filipinos who served in the First World War. These are the boundaries today of historic Filipino town. And um, here's another example of a map that takes you to show a much broader um, part where historic Filipino town is just one component. But what you see is the way in which the whole Los Angeles region was carved up um, by the Spanish and the Mexican rancho land grants that were made in the late 18th and early 19th century. So here you have a list of possible maps that one can overlay, historical maps. And again, one chooses collections on this side in order to connect them with particular maps. One of the things that we've tried to do as well, besides creating this open platform where students have put together video oral histories, uh, Flickr photo feed feeds, have conducted oral histories with elders in their community, is to also make it possible for people to look at scholarly vetted content, which is on the right-hand side here. This is um, Phil Ethington's um, an initial version of his book, Ghost Metropolis, uh, which is coming out this year, a history of Los Angeles over 13,000 years. The idea being that he thinks that one needs to investigate the long history of the Los Angeles Basin and its many complex regional histories that were ruling uh, this area. You have a scholarly article on the one side, but you have the ability to put additional material created by the community, created by the youth, in conversation. And so what this does is it already begins to create a new relationship between scholarly and community authorship. This is not something that Phil himself had planned, but rather as I was browsing his ghost metropolis, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I could see what one of the youth from historic Filipino town were also saying about this region that he's talking about. And so a conversation, a digital kind of conversation, emerged in this particular juxtaposition. And there's countless other examples of exactly this. So this is the examples of what the um, youth in Hi-Fi did, which is they created a series of um, guided tours of uh, the land around, of the area of historic Filipino town, following the trajectory of um, what they did were aggregated identities of particular people, uh, a fountain pen boy, a Filipino service worker, um, and two, uh, two others, with the ideas that one could follow in their footsteps, essentially, through the city space and understand something about uh, that, that sort of absent or, or erased history. So this is the project which I'll conclude with, and then I'll show you some of the live uh, social media projects, um, which won't require my voice as much, hopefully. The Los Angeles project has since moved into this um, almost launched platform on um, a kind of a collaborative mapping and visualization platform of LA with the idea of linking academic researchers, community organizations, and citizens together in authoring aspects of the history of Los Angeles. What we have on the left-hand side is a series of GIS data uh, connected to census track over the past 50 years. So going back 1940, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 2000, and um, concerning education, occupation, residence, age, housing, population, marital status, and income. And we have hypercities embedded within this website with a series of uh, featured collections uh, concerning um, Los Angeles. And this is, again, with all the authoring tools and interoperability that Hypercities has. So one could completely imagine this as an extensible thing. It's not by any means a finished thing. So one opens it up. Uh, the Hi-Fi collection on the right-hand side, um, what you have are a series of maps 
a series of uh, video histories told by, um, there's about 150 of them now, told by the youth, told by their parents, told by a series of community um, organizers and other leaders in the historic Filipino town area. And they talk about their neighborhood. They talk about their lives. They talk about the history of coming to Los Angeles. Almost all of them are first generation. And um, how they understand this, the, their, their circumstances really begins to illuminate, again, talking about giving, um, giving voice uh, to this place. Now, this becomes particularly interesting when one connects it with the quantitative data with the GIS. Because what you've had in the past is usually, again, a traditional kind of separation. On the one hand, you have hard data, right, the GIS data, often in maps that look like uh, this one. But you often don't have them animated by the voices and the people who live there. And so the idea of this project was really to bring the quantitative and the qualitative together, to bring the storytelling and the data together in a common platform in order to enhance one another. So you can see exactly, you know, I'd like to say, you know, what was the median income of historic Filipino town the last time the census was taken? And it turns out it's between, uh, it's the lowest, between zero and 35,000. Um, so I'm beginning to think, okay, what if I did something else? What if I looked at median income trend over time? It's relatively stable. So this is over, over um, from 1970 to 2000. So this is an area where you see very little change in income levels. Now, I thought, well, let's compare. Let's zoom out. Um, Beverly Hills, uh, Pacific Palisades, right? Drastic changes, right? So over time, these are the changes in income level compared to the relatively flatness of income level here. And I thought that's very interesting. Is that, again, it kind of just sheds some additional context for understanding these stories, for understanding this region. Even more, you can take, um, there's a map of the historic Filipino town underneath of there. This is the region. These are the video uh, oral histories. And now we have, um, in 2000, high school versus college. Um, vast majority uh, here, almost 75% um, in these census, this is by census track, um, often higher than 50% or at least 50% in almost the entire area around historical Filipino town of not having uh, college education. It's interesting because so many of the students are talking about their own ambitions. They're talking about the idea of going to college. They're talking about their dreams and aspirations. They're 16, 17, 18 years old. And if the data tells us anything, it tells us that more likely than not, they're not going to end up on college. And one sees this just by, again, bringing the GIS data together with, these, with, their, with their own stories. It becomes a very powerful uh, visualization and also politically something that we've been using because we've been working with the councilman Garcetti's office in Los Angeles where historic Filipino town falls in order for them to understand a bit more of the history and context of the region that, uh, that he's the council man, uh, member for. Then I thought, let's just put another piece of data on top because this is also kind of interesting. We have uh, redlining data from LA. Um, this is not done by us. Rather, it's done by Richard Marciano and David Goldberg who run a project, um, a collaborative mapping project that looks at the history of redlining in the United States. Redlining, as, as you certainly know, was uh, a practice, institutional practice in the United States by the Home Loan uh, Corporation to decide where home loans should be made. Um, areas that were red were considered very dangerous, uh, that is to say very risky. Oftentimes the land was uh, composed of uh, immigrants. It was quote unquote uh, heterogeneous. Uh, heterogene heterogeneity was something that was frowned upon by the corporation. And I thought, hmm, it's interesting that in the 1930s this was uh, considered a red-lined area. Uh, and we know this by just sticking that map on. So this is kind of the idea of the Los Angeles project, is to begin to open up, uh, bringing together the data, the stories, animating the landscape in, in a way that would begin to um, be not just a source of knowledge, but also a place of participation and kind of, uh, I would say, awareness uh, of the complex layers that are ever present in any historical landscape. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna end the PowerPoint and show you a couple of live examples, provided this is still up. And um, hopefully my voice will stay with us. So this is, um, when you launch HyperCities, this is what you have, and I think I'm not gonna go through this too much, but what I do wanna show you is uh, 
a couple of social media projects, which I think are pretty interesting. Um, so let me go to Tehran and uh, show you some other examples of projects that we've been working on. And so what I'm doing here is um, in, we're in Tehran. I don't have any historical maps of Tehran, but we do have a featured collection uh, that was created in about Tehran. And uh, this is an example of uh, the beginnings of a social media um, project that we've been working on for the past year or so, which started with the election protests in 2009, and uh, with the idea of what would it look like to make a kind of geotemporal documentation, almost like a day-by-day -day account of those protests, utilizing resources that were available uh, through social media. And this was a project that we supported. It was done by a graduate student at UCLA by the name of Zareen Eskandar, who is um, herself um, located in Los Angeles, uh, but from, uh, um, from Tehran. And what she did was she made a series of collections that go day by day, um, often hour by hour, documenting uh, what happened in Tehran in 2009. Um, gunshots heard, um, streets blocked, uh, various sorts of uh, things. Let me yeah, open, show you what one of these look like. So what happens is the maps load um, and center that for you. And as you go through the collections here, what you have are a series of videos, Twitter feeds, um, Flickr, and so forth that give you locations of where things were happening. And it's done by time. And so she has basically hand geocoded all of these locations as best she could. Um, there's about 1,500 objects in this collection. And uh, we know the time. She basically used her knowledge and collaborators in Tehran to figure out where these places were. And uh, she stuck them in the locations. And she did this day by day. So often, you know, 3 p.m., heavy security around uh, this particular square video. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And this is just a single day, all the way through the evening, um, including routes that were followed, routes that were blocked, and, and so forth. So this particular day has maybe 15 YouTube videos, Twitter feeds, Flickr, as well as her own documentation uh, about what happened. And that's just a single day um, within this broader collection. Now, this uh, was an interesting. Uh, first go, I thought, because for one thing, it showed the way that social media was beginning to be used um, to document and foment uh, revolution, right? Um, and of course, it also, as we know all too well in Tehran, it was also used with a tremendous backlash. Um, the government used social media, particularly Flickr, uh, to find people and to jail them. Um, and so this became a very precarious project that raised a number of ethical questions about what it would mean to save and curate this kind of data, particularly when um, the outcome is anything but secure. Uh, these histories of the present uh, is what I've been calling them, or sort of hypercities now. Um, if you went to now.hypercities.com, uh, it'll take you to a series of these new projects that look at social media and, uh, and have this uh, geographic presentation of the data. Um, this is a project that was done, I mentioned, by hand. And we've since been working with uh, Twitter feeds and Flickr and YouTube uh, to automate a process uh, insofar as we can retrieve location information and we have time information to visualize it on maps and then to archive that data. And I'll tell you, I'll show you the, the Egypt project because that um, is, a, yeah, that's fine. is a good example of that. Um, Actually, I think maybe this is at, at Japan, actually. But it's also equally interesting. Um, so this is a project that we're calling HyperCities Now. And the idea is to take um, social media feeds, um, primarily Twitter in this case. And we've been archiving them, these feeds, again, based on a bounding box, based on a time parameter. So we decide, OK, with regard to the tsunami, we started a little before March 11th. Um, the tsunami hit around um, it was March 11th at 2.45 uh, in the afternoon in Japan. And um, you have very few, actually, Twitter feeds, but you have, you have a number. Um, but what's interesting, if you, if you go to these feeds, um, because we've archived them, 
you can play them, you can watch them unfold, and in the case of Japan, it's of course an unmitigated tragedy, um, profoundly disturbing, but at the same time, a record of a historical event uh, through social media, and one which can be analyzed for a number of, I think, possible uh, outcomes that could be useful, particularly concerning uh, crisis management, disaster relief, uh, even uh, getting information out um, not to mention a record, so to speak, of those, of those events. Um, let me go to the Egypt one. We have about, let's see, yeah, hyperseas Egypt. You see a couple of changes. We, we utilized uh, the simile time bar uh, for, for Egypt. And um, this we stopped archiving because we simply have too much stuff. Um, but if you were to go, say, to February 11th, which is the day Mubarak uh, resigned, and uh, even to go to the speech, we have almost 10,000 tweets around 6 p.m., which is when he delivered his, his resignation speech. And these are grabbed from location parameters in Twitter. Some of them have latitude and longitude, if they were uh, put up on a phone that had that. Others have various levels of granularity with regard to the, um, the location of the tweeter. Um, one thing we are sensitive to, and something that I think, again, goes to that ethical question about this kind of data, we ambiguated uh, latitude and longitude uh, when it returned nine decimal places to us, which actually gave you the exact location of the person tweeting. We only displayed down to two decimal places with the idea that a one kilometer radius might be a safe distance, so to speak, in terms if this data was ever harnessed by people uh, that wanted to track down who was uh, saying what uh, against the government. Um, this is a question that you know, I would be more than happy and interested to discuss because it raises huge issues. I mean, this data is, is public, that is to say it is made open. Users uh, commit to certain agreements when they uh, create this data and decide how much they want to reveal about their location and identity and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we're doing is basically streaming it live as well as archiving it and allowing people to, to go back and, and, and play uh, those, that, that play or, or, or see that archived data. Um, so this is, yeah, February 11th, 2011, and it'll basically, as it plays, it goes uh, up uh, on, a, on a map. We have, what I found it's interesting in, in, um, in Egypt is about half is in Arabic, half is in English, which also may indicate something about the population who's tweeting. Um, in the case of Japan, almost 99% is in Japanese, and we have a, a Google trend. We use Google Translator uh, there to, to view that to view that data. Um, but this is what we're trying to imagine here: is how we can connect, say, social media feeds like Twitter, like Facebook, YouTube, with the historical data, the rich GIS data, the stories, the narratives, the long historical past. And the idea is to bring these two projects together. So HyperCities being a project about historical time layers, and then projects like this, which utilize uh, social media as also opening up uh, participation, opening up the public sphere in, in a way that's really, I think, um, very substantial, very radical, and potentially um, down the road will be very important for the way historians and cultural historians understand uh, these, these processes and, and, and the role that social media played in our information landscape uh, of the present. So this is, uh, I guess I'll, I'll end with this project because I think this is, this is a project which is only a couple months old and uh, is one that I think raises some really interesting questions um, for archiving and also ethics concerning uh, this data. To give you just a an under, under understanding of how much data we're talking about. With regard to Japan, there's about 650,000 uh, tweets that are specific to the Sendai region that, we, that we've archived. Egypt, it's about 500,000. And Libya, it's just libya.hypercities.com, it's about 300,000. And so I'm also imagining, and something we're working with our library at UCLA, Special Collections, to do is to consider this data as a special collection, something that should be um, kept by the library. And in the context of these events, um, certainly it's important material that can then be data mined, visualized, analyzed in ways that I think um, we at this point uh, have only begin, begun to think about. So 
why don't I end there? And it looks like my voice has come back a little bit, so I'm really happy. Thank you for um, your patience. And I'm happy to take questions and, and show you some of the other collections live uh, within HyperCities. I think um, it looks like the web, the, the web is working pretty well, so I can do that. So thank you. Just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about engaging your communities, because obviously it would be fantastic to uh, have more of this going on and contextualizing information via space time. But of course, uh, if, uh, I think probably some of your real success has been maybe uh, engaging the communities around these things. Sure. Well, perhaps the most persistent um, connection with the community has really been uh, in the Los Angeles area, and it's. It's, I think the sort of flagship project that we've done is the one that I mentioned about historic Filipino town and the collaboration with uh, Councilman Eric Garcetti's office. One of the things we're doing with this project, once this is the live version of the project, once we're done with it at the end of the month, and this has been supported by the, the Haynes uh, Foundation, which supports research on LA, is to make this available more broadly to community organizations and not only the, because the data is for the entire county of Los Angeles, um, but also the authoring tools uh, are already extant so that other community organizations, nonprofits, museums, what have you, um, can make use of these tools in order to um, create collections about their own, um, their own areas. This is something which is, is really at the heart of the project, is really, again, a single person can't possibly, even a group of, you know, a small group of people can't possibly create um, the range of collections that need to be made. Um, the data over here is primarily uh, put together by um, Phil Eppington at USC and some of his collaborators uh, um, there. And uh, that data will be, I think, tremendously useful as you begin again to kind of connect it with the, the qualitative uh, storytelling aspects. Um, we're in conversations with a number of libraries and other institutions, particularly the New York Public Library, where we have a number of maps that uh, stream directly from their map servers, and uh, also have done quite a number of tests uh, with folks at the University of Virginia uh, to bring together some of their GIS data uh, into HyperCities and also to push our data into their, some of their systems. So this is, uh, in many ways, this idea of, of building HyperCities as, uh, as a, um, a kind of web service is something that is also relatively new. That is to say, even four or five years ago, this was not the way that we had imagined the project. And over time, it's changed as both the technologies as well as the possible collaborations with community members um, have expanded. So um, yeah, this I think would be the best example. I can show you the, the Hi-Fi project. I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, the redlining project is another one. Let me turn that off. Um, we have a limited screen base here, so I'm going to have to kind of like do a sort of half and half thing so you can sort of see it. Um, yeah, so this uh, this Hi-Fi collection is, is, the, is the one that we created, um, our, and it's primarily by the Filipino Workers Center. It's by a group of artists and uh, media activists uh, associated with a group called Public Matters. And uh, it's a collaboration with USC and UCLA as the two institutional partners. And so when you open up uh, these, these personal stories, as I had showed you uh, a couple, um, these are all um, caregiver stories, stories of particular families, stories by particular youth. These are oral video histories, stories of particular veterans, uh, family histories, and really extraordinary trove of, of resources that um, that shed, I think, uh, a light that, uh, that I think, yeah, these will take a second to load because they're all coming uh, from Vimeo, but they'll load. <laughs> uh, there you go. So, and, and they're, some of them are really quite moving. This is uh, one of our interns uh, and his, his American dream. I think this is an odd. <laughs> I'm 19 years old, 
my nickname is Nanak. When I was, I think in the fifth grade or sixth grade, I used to own a, a flying rooster. And since then, I began throwing chickens and playing with it. When I was 13, we came here to Los Angeles, the historic Filipino town, for vacation. We spent here, um, I think, two months. We went back to the Philippines. Uh, in any case, you can explore these in, in a lot of detail. And there's really just so many of them. And each one uh, provides an angle of, of analysis and insight into the, into the very the granular specificity of building by building and location by location and, and really sort of time slice by, by time slice. Another question? These projects seem really extraordinarily well connected, the different pieces and, and, and the different media. It's really wonderful. Um, I'm curious how this, this kind of material can be cited and at what level of granularity. Um, I can imagine somebody writing about Berlin or writing about Los Angeles might want to hone in on a specific place or a specific region. How do you support that? Um, just like that. Uh, you click on link, and it gives you a, a link which will take you directly to that view that you're looking at. Um, and so there's, um, there's, of course, you can cite a number of things. You can cite the title and the creator. But this permalink exists for every level of every collection. And so you can be at the, in this case, I'm at a, a sub-collection of a collection. And so I'm within Hi-Fi Youth rather than within Hi-Fi, the broader collection. And so the permalink is different. And so this would be the, the what you would use. And that will also take you back directly to that uh, collection anytime. And that would be the citation that, that you would use. Um, with regard to maps, for example, we, you can export uh, in XML all the metadata about the maps. And you can also create a permalink to any view within HyperCities that you can embed in another website. That's a, a really useful feature, too, if you're, in fact, You've, you've gone through HyperCities and you know, I want this particular view of New York looking down Broadway at this angle in 1950. And uh, that's essentially a snapshot that then you can embed in another website. Um, so those are, I guess, the main, the main ways. Uh, that all objects have permalinks, all collections have permalinks, and all map data has uh, metadata, which is exportable, that can be um, cited. Um, as you go forward, accumulating this mass of different types of data, tweets, uh, geo information, do you have any observations, advice, speculations about the sort of the task of um, managing, curating the accumulating you know, stuff that you've got to make all this happen, and, and how that's going to you know go forward over like 10, 10 years or more? Yeah. I mean, this is perhaps the biggest challenge of a project like this. I mean, insofar as you're building a, a platform you're, you're, and you've created authoring tools, um, the, the mass of data is, is growing uh, tremendously. And there's all kinds of different sorts of data. And, and, uh, and some of it is housed locally. Other is uh, in repositories, who knows where. Some of it's fed into hypercities. Some of it breaks. Um, an example of this is uh, the Tehran project that I showed you earlier, um, where we didn't archive any of, the, any of the social media stuff. That is to say, everything was a link uh, to YouTube or Flickr or what, Twitter pics or what have you. And what we know is that um, more than 20 or 30 percent of the YouTube videos have since been, ta been taken down. Um, and so when you click on them, it says video no longer available. Um, that's, there might be lots of reasons for this. I mean, it might be that the person who created it has realized that they're, you know, they maybe might be in danger and they want to get rid of it. Um, but um, with regard to the fact that much of this data is on external repositories, it does create this problem that of the fragility of the interlinks between the, between the data and whether the entire thing, uh, so to speak, both the links, the network links themselves as well as the things that they're linked to. Uh, should be archived, and that's something that we haven't done yet. I mean, what we've been doing is we we, we archive network links. Um, the whole idea of the project was to basically not really to host data at all, but to host network links to various sorts of data repositories, uh, whether it's GIS, whether it's you know photo repositories, what have you. 
Um, but it, of course, raises that very big question about, well, who's going to guarantee that it's going to continue to work? Who's going to oversee it? Who's going to preserve it? Who's going to uh, evaluate it, right? Um, and you know, within the hypercities itself, there are a various, there's tiered levels of, uh, of um, production and access. And that's, I think, important. That is to say, there's, on the lowest level, there's a kind of anything goes idea, which is public collections. Anyone can log in, they can create one, and it becomes uh, public. Um, some stuff is really interesting. Other stuff is not so good. Um, and that's the nature of an open platform. We also have, uh, we have an authoring, uh, we have a, a collaborative, a, a, a collection, uh, it's a, a group of professors and community advisors who um, will work with people who are authoring collections and uh, kind of, if they want that collection that they're creating to be quote unquote featured or published or if they want to in fact take HyperCities and embed it in, in their own website, we'll work with those teams. Uh, and the idea being that they have the authority uh, and are, are responsible for the content that they're creating. And ideally, you know, they have the, they have the credentials uh, to evaluate the stuff they're making. That's definitely the case with regards to the LA project. I mean, this stuff has all been curated and vetted. It's not the anything goes model. Um, but then somewhere in between, we have classes. Um, and classes are interesting because there, the professor or the person, you know, TA, whomever, can assign privileges uh, to people to be able to add or access or delete material. Um, they can allow their class to do that, but not other people. Um, they can decide if it's public or private, if it's visible or invisible. So a lot of the, the classes within HyperCities are actually not visible because for obvious reasons, maybe the professors or the students don't want their material public. Some do, uh, which is great. Uh, there's a lot of interesting material created by the students, but not all of it's, um, not all of it's uh, public. Um, one other way is that we, we work with our course management system at UCLA. HyperCities is a, is a tool that uh, works with Moodle, and so an instructor, students and instructor would log in through Moodle and then only see the material for their class. They actually not, are not thrown into the general HyperCities environment where they see everything. And so it's another way of filtering uh, and curating the experience that the students have uh, with the idea that the professor is in charge of week by week what the students will see. And the students have certain access privileges for what they can and can't do. You know, they can't delete the professor's things, but they can delete their own things. They can't delete their classmates' things. You know. So basic kind of just uh, privileges. So if you wanted to learn more about it, I would just go to the main site um, at hypercities.com, which is um, this. This is where you would launch Hypercities. And all the collections that I mentioned today, um, the Egypt collections, um, the, uh, the uh, Bowman Forum uh, collection, um, some of the other uh, information about the, the Tehran project and the Hi-Fi project and things we've done, it's all on the website here. There's actually quite a bit of information about sort of education, research, publications, and how to. We're, we're feverishly producing more how to's so that people can learn to use the platform and with some ease. So it, it does have a learning curve, uh, and uh, it's something that both for professors and community organizations, it's easy enough to view things, but if you're actively involved in the curation and creation of content, um, certainly the learning curve is a little bit more steep, and so we've tried to have some guides for how to get started, and then also an active help forum to, to, to guide users. So all the information is at there at hypercities.com. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for um, an amazing whirlwind tour. Um, and I have a feeling uh, a number of us are going to be off to hypercities.com to explore this in uh, uh, more detail ourselves. Um, please join me again in thanking Todd for a fantastic presentation. He's given us a lot to think about here as we travel on home. And let me wish you all safe travels. And if I don't see you before, I look forward to seeing many, many of you in December.
Bye-bye.